As we begin this morning, would you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much. Lord, just for the opportunity to be here in this place together with believers, the freedom to do so. Lord, as we open your scripture and open your word, we just ask that you would speak your truth to us, not mine. Lord, shut me up. You speak today. We love you. We praise you in your name. Amen. This morning, we are wrapping up the series that we've been in called Be the Light. And we've been talking a lot about what does it look like for us to be the light in a dark world. And I'm really excited. Next week, Pastor Steve is going to start a new series called Reflections. And really, this series called Reflections, in a lot of ways, is kind of the sequel to this series that we're in now. And, and as P- Pastor Steve has uh, said before, as the moon reflects... The sun, um, this new series is talking about how we can reflect the sun, Jesus Christ. It should be a lot, a lot of fun. I hope you'll join us. There's cards in your worship folder. It's a great, great opportunity to invite somebody. So I'm a recent homeowner, and one of the things you have to do as a homeowner is you have to buy your own light bulbs, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) And so I had this porch light, and it was really dim. So I'm thinking, okay, I just, I just need a new light bulb. What they don't tell you is that when you go to the store to get a new light bulb, you have to have a PhD because there's like six aisles worth of light bulbs of varying colors and sizes. They even have a, a, a candelabra bulb. I mean, what? come on now. There's so many different types of bulbs, bases. You can buy a, a, a light bulb based on the lumen count. What? Somebody's making up words for light bulbs. I don't know. Different colors. You know, how, how am I supposed to know if I'm supposed to get a bulb that's soft or hard light? Come on now. I don't, I don't know these things. And then they, they, it's almost like they, they taunt us. You know, they, they put this little sticker down on there, and it, it says, well, this is how much energy this light bulb will use. Like I know what that means. I mean, I just look at that number and go, okay, that number's low. I guess that's a good thing. I guess I'll get this one. But I, I, I don't know anything about light bulbs, so I, I'm at the store. I finally, I pick a light bulb. I get home. I, I take the cover off, which that was a process. Good Lord, it took me like 15 minutes just to get the cover off. I put the new light bulb in there, put the cover back on to realize that this entire time, it wasn't even the light bulb that was the problem. It was the shade that covers the light bulb. It was so dark that it doesn't let the light shine through it. See, I think this is exactly what happens to us as Christians. It's not the light that's the problem, but it's the things that are in our lives that shade us from being the light. See, we've been talking about this whole series about how we are supposed to be the light. We're supposed to study His Word, serve His people, share in His mission, show His love, seek His character. But these things are hard to do if we're being shaded by things in our lives. If you want to follow along in your outline, I'm going to breeze through a couple of these. These are some of the things that I think shade us from being the light. I think we find ourselves often shaded by fear. I think we're afraid to fail, afraid to be rejected. Maybe we're afraid of what the light might reveal, afraid to leave the comforts of our homes or our regular business, afraid that maybe God can't use us. I think we're also shaded by busyness. And I don't think that it's not just that we sometimes don't have the time, we definitely don't make the time. I think sometimes it's an issue of our priorities. We just don't have priorities to look up to see other people, to be the light to those people. Sometimes we get so caught up in our own lives that we just don't see the people that are next to us that are hurting. I think that oftentimes we're shaded by bad habits and not just what it looks like when people see us with bad habits, but also I think that it's those bad habits that take time and money and energy out of our lives, and I think it just makes us a bad testament to Jesus, tends to focus the attention on ourselves. Sometimes we're shaded by bad attitude. I've been teaching the youth a lot about this, and we've been talking a lot about the word countenance, which is all about expression. 
You guys understand this. It's not just our words, but our actions and the looks that we give other people that say a lot of things. And sometimes it's just simply how we say it. I know that I'm not the only person here today who's heard their mother say at one point or another, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. Okay? Anybody else heard that before? I've heard that a few times. It's our attitude. How we look, how we speak to people, it, it, it matters. we we got to understand that we're either going to uplift or put down someone when they interact with us. If people come off the street that don't know Jesus Christ, the last thing they want to do is walk into a building where they're just going to face negativity. And the last piece of this, is, I think that oftentimes we're, we're shaded by complacency. And what I mean by that is that I think it's too easy for us to become uncaring, unbothered, unsympathetic towards the world. We can sometimes distance ourselves from the rest of the world, kind of living in a bubble, blind to what is happening around us, blind to what's happening in the darkness, blind to the struggles that some people face. But also I think it's sometimes that we're blind to our own ability to make a difference. And not that we're not willing or don't want to, but sometimes we don't know what to do or where to start. But if we plan on being the light, we're going to have to learn to confront some of these things. We're going to have to learn to figure out what it is that is shading our light and begin to take those shades off. I want to spend the rest of my time this morning giving you a few thoughts of some things that can help you do that. And the first thing I think can help you is if we learn to embrace the broken. I am a uh, second-generation Church of God pastor, which means that I was a pastor's kid, which really means that I was forced to do a lot of things that I didn't really want to do. I've put way too many chairs away in my entire life. One time, my family, we, we, we had to unload an entire semi-truck of pumpkins simply because the truck came at the wrong time, and my dad, I guess, thought it would be good family bonding. I, I don't know. Uh, that wasn't the case, by the way. But one of the things that I always had to do was foot washing. And when I was younger, I really wasn't wild about foot washing. I thought it was a little weird, uh, but I didn't have a choice. I had to go anyways. And, and it's cool because I ended up growing to really love and appreciate it. But there was, I, I remember being back in the day, I have two older brothers, and we should probably never be allowed to sit next to each other. But one time in foot washing, we're sitting next to each other, and there's this guy that's there. His name's Mr. Pierce. I, I remember this vividly. And he took off his, his shoes and socks, and me and my brothers looked over, saw his feet, and went, nope, not today. We, I, without trying to be mean or rude, Mr. Pierce's feet were just nasty, okay? There's, there's no better way to put it. But I remember my dad getting on his knees and washing Mr. Pierce's foot. And it it was a message to me. And and in that moment, I learned something very, very important, that it's, it's really not about whether or not you're willing to wash someone's feet. And don't hear me wrong, it's a beautiful, powerful service. And if you've never done it, I recommend that you do it at least once. It is a really cool thing. But to me, foot washing is, it's all about making a statement to God to say that I am ready to serve you, I'm ready to follow you, I'm ready to serve as you did, even if it's going to make me a little uncomfortable. It's not just about washing the clean feet of people that we like, but it's about serving the Mr. Pierces of the world and doing it regardless of whether or not we're comfortable. Matthew 25, 35 through 40 says this, For when I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick, you cared for me. I was in prison, you visited me. And the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you? Hungry and feed you. Or thirsty and give you something to drink. Or a stranger and show you hospitality. Or naked and give you clothing. When did we ever see you sick and in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it unto me. I highlighted a piece of this because I I absolutely love it, and I I love what it communicates to us. It says, Lord, when did we ever see you? I love this because I I think what in Scripture it's saying is that, that these were people who were committed to serving others. 
They weren't looking for a response. They were serving simply because they wanted to love others and they wanted to do the right thing. These are people that looked around intently enough to see when people were hurting, when they saw this broken world full of broken people, and what they did is they embraced it with open arms. Who are the least of these around you and your life? And my question for us, can they afford for you to miss them? And can they afford for you to do nothing? I picked the word embraced intently. When I think of the word embrace, I think of like a big bear hug, a close embrace. And, and it's not easy to embrace the least of these. Let's be honest for a couple minutes, okay? The least of these don't always smell good. The least of these aren't always trustworthy. It's not easy to embrace the homeless, to embrace the lonely or the broken or the unlovely, to embrace the atheists, to embrace our enemies, our rivals. It's not easy for us to deal with our internal biases. But we have to do it because what it does is it forces us to change the lens in which we see the world and the way in which we see the people in the world. It's not easy to take off these shades, the shades of judgment, ignorance, bitterness, frustration, pride. But we've got to learn to see the world through the eyes of Jesus Christ, to become people of compassion, to be become people that, that spring into action to those in need, regardless of who they are and regardless of what darkness surrounds them. People that don't react or run or sneer their head at other people's darkness, but people that are willing to face the valley of the shadow of death because the light is with them. People willing to see beyond the surface and to reach out with the light of love of Jesus to break these cycles of darkness. One of my favorite authors, Martin Luther King Jr., I want to share this quote with you, and, I, and it's really important to understand now the context in which he writes this quote. There's some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. When we look beneath the surface, beneath the impulsive evil deed, we see within our enemy neighbor a measure of goodness and know that the viciousness and evilness of his acts are not quite representative of all that he is. We recognize that his hate grows out of fear, pride, ignorance, prejudice, and misunderstanding. But in spite of this, we know that God's image is ineffably etched in his being. And then we love our enemies by realizing that they are not totally bad and that they are not totally beyond the reach of God's redemptive love. Returning hate for hate only multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. So those of us that have the light and hope of Jesus, we can't do nothing. We can't, we can't sit around and hide and, and hope that the world is going to fix itself. It won't. I can't be the only one that learned that as a kid. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. We have to do that. Because if we have the light, there's people that are blinded, living in darkness, that need us to do something. Are we people that respond to the darkness with light? Are we being people that love our enemies, people who embrace the darkness? Part of the cool thing about the series that we're doing and the power packs that some of you have received, and you can receive one today if you haven't, there's a couple lists in there. There's one, there's a list of, of just acts of kindness that you can do for people you know and people you don't know. And there's another one that just gives you opportunities and places to serve, not only within our church, but in our community. Let's take off the shades and make a commitment to raise our heads to, to see people and to embrace the broken. The next piece of this is I think that we have to learn to be a disciple and not a savior. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to raise your hands if you have heard of Batman and Robin. Some of y'all are lying. Okay, if you've, if you've not heard of Batman and Robin, we have a couple pictures for you. There's Batman and Robin, the dynamic duo. And then for those of you that maybe are a little older, maybe that looks a little more familiar. So the crazy thing I know that uh, those of you that know me are thinking, okay, here we go again. Will's talking about Batman. But actually, let's, I'm being honest, you may not believe me, this is the first time I've ever used Batman as an illustration while preaching. Okay, 
So you should feel honored. But Batman is a superhero, and if you don't believe that, you have the right to be wrong. It's okay. <laughs> Batman was born out of tragedy. His parents were murdered in front of him, and in that moment, he makes this vow. He, he begins this mission to make sure that this doesn't happen to anybody else. But unfortunately, it does. It happens to an acrobat named Richard Grayson, who becomes the first Robin. Robin is the boy wonder, and he, let's be honest, he's probably a little too young to be a vigilante. But he's on Batman's team. He's his sidekick. But Robin is not doing this as a solo mission. He's joining Batman's mission on his terms, with his gadget, with his training, and with his help. Robin isn't left alone to be the hero on his own. The whole point is that he's going to be help. He's going to be the sidekick. He's going to be backup. And I believe that this is exactly what Jesus is inviting for us to be a part of. Jesus is wanting for us to be his sidekick, to be a disciple, not to be a savior. Scripture tells us that we, as human beings, are supposed to be the lampstand, not the lamp, not the light. So we're supposed to hold up the light, to let the light shine through us, but it's not our job to be the light. It's, it's not a good idea to try to carry on the mission of God by yourself on your own. If we try to carry the light on our own, we're only going to end up getting burnt. If we try to be the hero, we're only going to be frustrated in disappointment. See, because unless you're next to Batman, you don't have access to his gadgets. We lack the power to save. Peace, joy, love, patience, mercy, grace, forgiveness. These are all things that are not out of this world. So we're not going to find him here on this world. So without being close to the Father, we will never have access to those things. Maybe some of you, you've been trying to forgive somebody with no avail. And maybe that's simply because you've not been spending enough time resting with the one that's forgiven you first. Maybe one or more of your relationships has been fractured and, and you just don't know what to do. Or maybe you've not been sitting in the presence of the one that loved you first. Maybe you're on your last nerve with everybody that you work with because you've lost sight of the one that was patient with you first. Maybe you're frustrated because you can't control others and you forgot that salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. There's this crazy story in Scripture, uh, it's in Acts 19, about this group of guys that Scripture calls the seven or six sons of Sceva. I don't know, Sceva, it's weird, I don't know. I'm probably mispronouncing that. That's fine. They don't care. I asked them. So they get this idea, right, that they're going to walk around and that they're going to heal people in the name of Jesus and in the name of Paul. And the crazy part about this story is that for a while it works for them. They're walking around. They see people that are demon-possessed or people that are not feeling well, and they say, in the name of Jesus and in the name of Paul, be healed or, or, or whatever they say. And for a while it works, but then <laughs> there's one scenario where they come against an obstacle that is just a little too much for them. And that's the, the piece of scripture that's in your outline I want to read to you. It's Acts 19, 15 through 16. It says, but one time when they tried it, an evil spirit replied, wait a second, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? And the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. I've been in a few fights in my life. I've seen more. In my middle school, there was probably at least one fight a day. And that's not an exaggeration. And can I tell you that I never saw at the end of the fight where someone was naked. So I want you to think about this. These guys, the, the, these guys got beat up so bad that they left naked, okay? We're not, we're not talking about they got slapped in the face. These dudes got worked over. They got messed up. You know why? Because they were trying to do the work of Christ without Christ. And that's a dangerous thing. These men thought that they could be the light apart from Jesus by using the power of his name. But the access to the real power of God is all about being in relationship with him. It's all about connecting, being in close proximity with Jesus. I don't know if you guys have realized this, but Wi-Fi has changed our world. 
And we could argue probably day and night about whether or not that's been a good thing or a bad thing. All I know is that if Wi-Fi were to go down, I'm not sure I'd know how to pay my bills. Okay. I don't know about this stamp stuff and putting stuff in an envelope. It seems too difficult. Okay. I'd be in trouble. But it's, it's, it's changed the way that we do things. We have, we have become so reliant. And, and there's nothing more frustrating than when you have a weak signal and, and at the page is like, please load. Please load. It's, it's like going back to the days of dial-up. How many of you guys old enough to remember that? Like that's the worst. I like have nightmares about that sound. Okay, It took like five minutes for a page to load. And it's like, Okay, what are, we, what are we doing here? But, but how often is that the truth of our spiritual lives? We're operating as Christians with a weak signal. It's like sitting in the parking lot of Starbucks and complaining about the Wi-Fi when all you got to do is walk in the building. It's free. You don't even have to buy anything. You can just sit down and use it. That's, it's the same thing with God. He's there. You just have to seek him. All you got to do is go inside. But instead, I think too many times we end up trying to be the solo hero. Batman is just a call away. Trying to do it on our own strength, and God is just a prayer away. I think a lot of us, we've, we've got to learn to quit fighting with our hands and to start fighting with our knees. See, if the signal is weak, what do we got to do? We got to get closer to the light, closer to the source. We got to make time to study his word to look for opportunities to serve his people, to share in his mission, to, to show his love and his kindness, to, to seek his character. These are all the things that we've been talking about this entire series. And you know what I noticed while I was preparing the sermon? They all have one thing in common. They're his. It's his mission. It's his people. It's his word. It's his character. So if we're not spending time with him, we're not doing any of these things right. It's all about our proximity to the Savior. The world doesn't need another Savior. It desperately needs more disciples and disciples that make disciples. Let's get motivated to embrace the broken and let's seek the presence of Jesus, his mission, his power, his way. Let me give you one more and we're going to take a, a step to the personal. One of my favorite movies of all time is Beauty and the Beast. It's okay. Go ahead and judge me now. And if you haven't seen the movie, there's this, this guy. He made an unwise choice. He ends up becoming this beast. And he ends up having this beautiful woman that moves in with him. Her name is Belle. And, and it's, it's not too long in the movie where Beast goes to Belle and says, listen, we have this ginormous castle, this mansion. You can go anywhere you want except for the West Wing. You can't go there. That's my, that's my hangout. Okay, you can't go to the West Wing. So the, the crazy thing is, is like the, the rest of the castle is like really upkept and nice, but not the West Wing because nobody's allowed in there. It's, just, it's destroyed. It's nasty. And it's not, he, he doesn't want anybody in there because it's unclean. He doesn't want anybody in there because it's his past. It's his brokenness. It's his failure. He doesn't want to let anybody into that. And it's easy to shake our heads at beast, but, but let's be honest for a second. We all have our own West Wing. We all have pieces of our life that we'd rather not deal with. Our own inner darkness, whether it's sin, brokenness, failure from our past, shame, it's just easier to hide. And that's usually our first response, and that's what Adam and Eve did. Hiding because they were naked and ashamed. Which is crazy because one of the first things God does is he kills an animal, makes them clothes, and covers their shame. The first animal sacrifice used to cover up the shame of Adam and Eve. They ran and hid in shame and in fear of a God who only sought to love them and cover their shame. So why are you running from God? See, God doesn't work a deal in shame, and anyone who fears God because of what they have done does not understand his perfect love because perfect love casts out fear. 
We've got to learn to let God in, to let him into our west wing, to let him into the temple of our hearts, to clear out the darkness with his light. There's a story in Scripture that I love. Jesus at some point comes and confronts Peter. Peter, as you know, has denied Christ three times. And in John 21, Jesus walks up to Peter and he asks him three times, do you love me? And Peter's hurt by that because, as you know, he denied Christ three times. So, so Jesus asking it the third time was reminding him he was bringing it up. He was bringing up Peter's darkness because it needed to be dealt with. John 21, 17, it says, A third time Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked this question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Jesus wasn't heaping on shame, but rather drawing it out like poison. Jesus is confronting Peter's darkness. And this is really, really important. Peter lets him in. Peter's letting him confront his darkness. And yes, it hurt. And it was probably hard to deal with, but it was worth it. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, I know you screwed up, but I have plans for you. Let me shed light on this dark area because I need you to become Petra, Peter, the rock of my church. And a month and a half later, Peter preaches and brings thousands to Christ. When was the last time you let Jesus look you in the eye and ask you, do you love me? One of my favorite authors, Henry Nouwen, says this. If there's any focus that the Christian of the future will need, it is the discipline of dwelling in the presence of the one who keeps asking us, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? James 5.16 says, make it your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed See, Scripture gives us this this idea, this model that when we confess to God, we find forgiveness, but when we confess to each other, we find healing and wholeness. This idea that we're not meant to carry the burden of our darkness by ourselves. And I feel like the Lord's been teaching me something lately, and and, and sometimes it's difficult for me to learn, is that too often I'm treating my, my life like fast food. Like I come to church and I just want to get in and, and get my food and, and get it at a good price and, and get home and get out of here. But it's hard to build relationships. It's, it's, it's hard for any of us to help each other carry each other's burdens when, when I, the only experience we have with each other is a drive through and, and life can be like that. Life can be like social media where, where we have all these connections but we have no depth. How many of us are here this morning and we're carrying burdens by ourselves simply because we've not had the time to take to get to know someone and build a relationship where we trust them? This past month, I've uh, been reaching out to one of my spiritual fathers. His name's Steve Seaton. He works at MacU. And I called him. I said, Steve, we got to start meeting. So I need, I need that person in my life that will look me in the eye and say, do you love him? that'll look me in the eye and ask me those hard questions that I don't want to deal with. Do you have somebody like that? Do you have somebody that is honest with you, but also loving, that is truthful with you, but not judgmental? Do you have somebody that'll ask you the hard questions, that'll walk through life with you? Have you looked for somebody to do that? Have you asked God for somebody to do that? And here's, here's the most important piece. Are you willing to let somebody do that. It's time to open the doors of our west wing to let in the light of Jesus at our own darkness. Are we willing to deal with our own darkness? And Jesus will be ready for us to join his side, his mission to embrace the broken, to embrace the darkness with his light. 1 John 1, 9 says this, but if we open up to our own sins, God shows us that he is faithful and just by forgiving us of our sins and purifying us from the pollution of all the bad things we have done. When God sacrificed the first animal to cover our shame, he knew that it was only a temporary fix. He knew one day he would have to send his son, the perfect lamb, 
to die on a cross, to be one final sacrifice for the world, one final bright light that would burn in the hearts of those who love him forever. This morning, we're going to partake in communion, and I'm going to ask for our ushers if they would come and prepare to serve us. And as we take communion and as you hold those elements in your hand, I hope you'll think about the sacrifice of Christ. And not just remembering the sacrifice of Christ, but also remembering the calling and the purpose that Christ has placed on your life. And it's not to hide your light. And it's not for your light to be shaded. Maybe as you hold those elements, you can think about what it looks like for you to embrace the broken world around you. What it looks like for you to join Jesus in his mission. And what it looks like to be willing to open up. And maybe you need to open up this morning and say, God, here's my west wing. The door is open. Please deal with me. Maybe you need to leave the room and give somebody a call and say, hey, I need to meet with you this week. I need you to ask me those hard questions. As we take communion, we're going to, ushers are going to pass it out. Here at Chartel, we practice open communion. So that means as long as you confess that Jesus is Christ, you're welcome to join us. And when you get your communion cup, the bottom cup is going to be the bread and the top will be the juice. If you would hold those, uh, we will take those together after everyone's been served and we pray to the Lord together. Ushers, would you serve us this morning? With a melody, you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, have chosen me love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer a slave to fear I am child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. No, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no child of God. As Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room, he took the elements and he blessed them. And Father God, thank you so much for your sacrifice. I'm so thankful that when you saw this world and when you saw us surrounded and suffocating in darkness, you didn't walk away. But you sent a source of light for us. 
that could ignite us and help us to hold the light inside of us. Father God, as we take these, I, I hope that we don't just remember your sacrifice, but we also remember the calling you've placed on our life to pick up our own cross and follow you. That we would take your light into the world with us. That we would hold it high for all to see. That we wouldn't be afraid of the darkness. Father God, as we take these elements, it would be our courage. We'd remember who you are and what you've done, and it would make us fearless to love people the way that you loved us. We love you. We praise you. In your holy name, amen. Thank you so much for being a part of our service today. We are uh, so excited about the new series that we're getting in uh, next week as Pastor Steve comes back, this Reflections. Uh, those cards are in your worship folders. Uh, feel free to invite somebody to come next week. Thank you for being here. We love you. You are dismissed.